If you have your Bibles, we'd ask you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And uh, sometimes the Lord chooses to do this, and it seems like me and Jared's uh, topic was in line with one another this morning. So uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and we're going to begin reading in verse 11. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 11, the Bible says, O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. You're not straightened in us, but you're straightened in your own bowels. Now for a recompense in the same, I speak unto you as children, be ye also enlarged. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion have light with darkness? And what concord have Christ with Belial? Or what part he that be, or he that have or, or what part had he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement have the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for all that you do for us. We thank you for your word and its guidance in our lives. Lord, we thank you that you're on the throne this morning and you work with everything after the counsel of your own will. Lord, that you need no advice from no one but yourself. We pray now that you would bless this word to the hearts of the ears. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, I'll be preaching this morning on the thought, why separate? Now, here the Bible clearly teaches that we are not to be a worldly bunch, that we are not to be like the world, we are not to act like the world, we're not to involve ourselves in the world, but why? And I believe the conclusion of the all matter is toward the end of the text, and we'll get to that in, the, uh, in a minute. But, you know, one thing I have seen in the last five, really five to ten years, is very few men of God are preaching on biblical separation. You know, there's a reason behind the things that we do. There's a reason that we don't get involved in the world. There's a reason that women ought to dress like women and men ought to dress like men. There's reasons behind that. The Bible teaches us very, very clearly. And I'll say to this, uh, just on the subject before we get started, that many times me and my family are, are mistaken for Pentecostal people just because the way that my wife and our daughters dress. And you know what? That's a shame. It's a shame on Baptist churches that we're mistaken for another group. Uh, it ought not to be so. And, and, and so he says, and he's getting back to the first letter that he wrote to the church at Corinth. If you remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I think it is, he kind of cleans their clock because there's a man there that's taken up with his stepmother. I hope it was his stepmother anyway. And, uh, and he says, you oughtn't to do that. And, and he, he put down the line back. He says, when you come back together, exclude that man. Get rid of him. And, uh, and, and so we see in that the Corinthian church had a response. Now, when you preach along these lines, anticipate a response because you're going to get it. Now, it may be good, and it may be, amen, pastor, 
or it may not be, it may not be so good. Uh, and, and so we see that as Paul is writing to the church, the second time to the church at Corinth, he, he is excited about their response to the first letter. Oh, ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you. Our heart is enlarged. He loves them more than he did before. He loves them more because of the response they had to the first letter. Now, when we look at the, this word of God, remember all the church letters and all the gospels written by men, but ordained by God. You know what's wrong with people today and their reverence of God, God's word? They've reduced it to the writings of men. <laughs> It's not the writings of men. It's the writings of the Almighty. And it, it must... See, if we, if we perceive the Word of God in that manner, you'll have no problem with the rest of it. Because the truth is that if we just view it as the writing of man, it's no, it's no better than what I write down. And so he, he's excited, and in fact, he loves them even more because of their response to what he had written. And remember, it wasn't the kindest letter you'll ever read. This is key. Verse 12, you're not straightened in us, but you're straightened in your own bowels. Now, to see this bowels thing, you have to you have to kind of understand the Greek culture, and they believed that the center of man was right here. They did not believe that the heart was the center of man. And English cultures teach that the heart is the center of man. If you really look at it, neither one is true. You're, the very center of most people's body is their navel. And uh, uh, so, uh, but anyway, he wasn't even talking about it in a physical sense. He knew they would understand the center of you is, is good. He says, you didn't straighten up because of my letter, he straight, you straightened up because you were right to begin with. In other words, you were a saved individual. You had been born again. You had a pure spirit. And so because of that, when you heard the truth, you straightened up to it. And he was excited. Isn't it an exciting thing when you see a church get right with God? It's exciting. And, and, and so he encouraged them in that. He was excited in that. And he was ready to throw them even further. Verse 13. Now for a recompense in the same, or a follow-up, or additional information, for a recompense in the, sa in the same, I speak unto you as children. Now, what is the difference between children and adults besides size and mentality? Uh, the real difference is this. It's knowledge. Exactly right. Now, the, the truth of the matter is you can't learn. You'll never learn everything. And I met people that thought they did know everything, but the truth was, was they didn't. But as your years go by, you learn more and more and more. If you have good parents, they teach you more and more and more. And so what Paul was saying, because I'm a good parent, because this church is important to me, I will take you a step further now. I, I'm going to add something uh, to what I, I taught you in the first Corinthian letter. I'm going to give you some stronger things. Now, uh, when my shoulder first got to bother me, I'd just take Tylenol at home. And, and, it, and it would help, and I, I could be okay for a while. And then I would take some more. And then I went to a doctor, and I got the wrong medicine. And I actually felt very good, but it about shut my kidney down. And so I had to be cautious. And then I got a third pill, and it certainly helps too. Uh, but it is a narcotic. So I'm a little bit weary of it. You see what I'm saying? They bumped me up. They advanced it, and it wasn't helping my pain, so they had to keep going up 
and up. So this little church at Corinth, they were ready for something new. They were ready for something a little stronger. They, they were ready for a heavier dose, if you will. And he says, I'm going to give it to you like a parent gives it to a child. He ends the verse, be also enlarged. In other words, just like you were enlarged or straightened the first time, grow in this. The very thing I'm about to tell you, I want you to advance in. Now, uh, if we had a baby and it wasn't growing, we'd be concerned. Most people don't know this. I don't even know if I've ever told Donna this. When I went into the hospital in July of 69, I was seven months old and still at my birth weight. That's something to be concerned about, isn't it? That, that's something to... And, and you know what? And, and God uses all people. And uh, Mom told me this herself. My grandfather looked at him. We called him Papa. Papa looked at, at, at my mother and said, June, you better get to this kid, to the doctor. Something's wrong. And, and you know, if we weren't advancing spiritually... We ought to be just as concerned, right? Amen. I don't want to be at my spiritual birth weight, do you? Uh, the Lord saved me over 40 years ago, and I want to be more advanced than I was then. And if not, somebody ought to be concerned about me. And the very same way here, he wanted them to develop on this stronger food. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now that's a tough statement. It's a hard statement. It can go in lots and lots of direction of different directions. And I've heard it preached on different directions. And it is a very hard thing. You know what? I can tell some of the trash the women talk at my at the nursing home where I work. They don't know God from, from a man in the moon. And that's hindering, isn't it? Best thing you can do is just get up and walk away. That's what I do. And uh, that way you don't hear that trash all the time. You know what? If you're nurtured on trash, you're going to start being trashy. Right? And, and, and so I just kind of set that aside. Uh, got to work, got to make a living somehow. But, you know, there's other things that we choose to do. I'm very thankful this church is a homeschooling church. You know, uh, we've got to be very careful what our, our, our children are taught in 2024. We, we need to be very cautious because, you know what? Uh, my mom did this when, uh, when we were kids, and she just wanted to see how it worked. Now, I can't remember the plant she used, but... She watered it with red Kool-Aid. You know what it did to the parent, to the plant? It turned it red. Mm -hmm. It took up what it was eating. You see what I'm saying? And uh, and in the same way, we will absorb that. So we can't. We need to be as separate for, as this is possible. And and I understand, and to some extent, we are correct, but. You know why Amish do what they do? Why Old Order Mennonite do what they do? They do not want their children exposed to this world. Sure. That, that, that is their whole culture. That is what it's about. And it's not so they won't look, they won't, they'll look stupid driving a buggy. No. You know, uh, one of my friends, he, uh, he, he lives down in West Tennessee. Uh, he, he tried to challenge me one time on the doctrines of grace back when we had that radio ministry. And he finally had to say, well, you're right. <laughs> and uh, good friend, his name's Tony. But there was an old order Amish group over there. And he was, he was talking to this Amish guy. They only lived with one of their babies. They, they had, I think, 18. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, Talking to that very nice guy, I was able to talk to him about the Lord. And he asked, Tony asked this fella, why do y'all drive buggies and stuff? 
Why don't you get a car? A car would make it, which, uh, this, a car would not have helped this guy out. They had to make six trips. Uh, but we, uh, he was just asking him, and he, he made a very profound statement. It will take them too far from home. That's good, ain't it? It will take them outside of the community. It will take them outside of what they've been taught. It will take them outside of what they know. That, that's, that's good theology, ain't it? And, and, and so we see that the very, the very same principle is taught here is that we don't need involvement in that. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship have righteous uh, with uh, what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? Now, that is what 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 fellowship have the saved with the unsaved? What what fellowship have biblical people with non-biblical people? Now, what does fellowship mean? We're fixing to have one here uh, Friday night uh, over at Olmstead Baptist Church. It's a fellowship. How is that fellowship possible? Because we agree on some things, right? Mm -hmm. How's a fellowship between me and Donna possible? It's because we agree on some things, right? We have principles that tie us together. What fellowship? Now, this is the problem. Sometimes we compromise and we do have things to fellowship about. And that's when there's problems, right? If we, if we cave into the world, fellowship begins. And we have to be very, very, very cautious. Verse 15. Uh, what concord hath Christ with Belial? Now, we know who Belial is. He is a, an, uh, this case, he's a Greek god, but he really, he really originated somewhere else. Uh, he's also called Baal. Uh, very, very same thing. Uh, just picked up by two different cultures, so they were called two different things. Uh, they still worship today. Most people will be very, very surprised within the Masonic Lodge here in the United States. That is their basis. It's still around. You see what I'm saying? So what agreement, you know, I, I, I've never worked very close to those people, but years ago, I worked with a man when I worked at the ambulance services over 30 years ago now. And he was always on me, you need to join the lodge. You need to join the lodge. And I didn't know what it was. I asked my father-in-law, and he kind of updated me a bit. And, uh, uh, but now this is one of the big things with them. You have this ceremonial attack, and one of the people whispers a name in your ear to get you out of the attack. And that name is not Christ. You see what I'm saying? And that is the premise. And you know what? They'll tell you, 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 you don't need anything but that. If you have that, you're going to heaven. No, dear friend, you're not. And, and, and so we find then that we need to evaluate each situation, not just groups that we become, become uh, involved in, each situation before we jump in. You see what I'm saying? Uh, every about quarter, or maybe it's just twice a year, Don and I both get um, little cards from the National Nurses Association. Sounds very nice, and nurses having a big group of them, right? Neither one of us are in it because of their stance on abortion. I cannot agree with that. I will not agree with that. But you know what? They keep trying to drum up business. They're, they're faithful with their every six months invitation. 
I have no business with those people. You see what I'm saying? Evaluate. Look. See what it says. We, we don't just need to jump off in a big pool of something until we know. So Paul, and remember, what was the big thing? Really, the emphasis of this with Paul was the Greek culture. You do not need to be involved in the Greek culture because they had so many gods you couldn't count them. Remember uh, Paul on Mars Hill? And they had so many statues, so many gods, and finally he found one and said to the unknown God. And he says, here's, here's Christ, here's the God of the Bible, and you don't even know who he is. That is why he wrote this. He wanted them to be different. And, and, and so we, as the Lord's people, certainly, we need to follow the same thing. If Corinth had this problem, certainly some churches today could have this problem as well. Verse 16, what agreement have the temple of God with idols? Now, mistakenly, sometimes we think of our meeting house as the temple. It is not. We have a meeting house because we're very blessed indeed. We don't have to have one, but we do. It's something to be thankful for. But you know what? Uh, Paul mentioned more than, more than one church that met from house to house. That's okay, too. I'm assuming they couldn't afford a building, and that's fine. And, and so as he's writing this, he's, and he'll explain in a moment very clearly, he's talking about this temple. This temple, the one that I have right here, and it needs to be carefully taken care of. Now, me and I think it was Brother Jody was talking about this downstairs before service time. We are so far from creation now, this flesh is born diseased. And it's getting worse and worse as the generations pass. Plus, as my mother-in-law pointed out, the garbage they give us in our food sure ain't helping the situation. And uh, so we, we see then, we got to take care of this. So the fact of exposing has to be damaging, or why would he have said it? You see what I'm saying? These things that we often get ourselves into is damaging not only to the spirit man, it's, it's, damaging, it's damaging to the flesh. I told some of you this. I had a 50-year-old friend. I preached his graveside service down at Cumberland City. Dear friend, he was so fun to be around. He died at 50 years old of alcoholism. I didn't get to see him. My friend Michelle did. Said he looked like a pumpkin. His liver completely shut down. Now, you younger folks, well, I'm sure y'all are thinking, well, at 50, I can see that. Well, listen, dear friend, 50 comes around quick. To me, people are 50 years old or young. Roger was a young guy to me. But you know what? Sin, sin came full circle, didn't it? The drinking finally got him. And, and so, why, why, you know what? And, and you will not find Bible to say that you can't have a glass of wine. Don't go there in your ministry because you're the one that's going to look like an idiot, not the other guy. But listen, I will say this. It's an addictive substance, and it doesn't say anything about drinking, but it has a whole, whole lot to say about drunkenness and drunkards. Yeah. And I don't know about you, I'm guessing that I probably couldn't control it. I don't drink anything and, and, uh, unless it's at the time of the church's uh, Lord's Supper because my granddaddy laughed that he was an alcoholic, my dad was an alcoholic, and I'd say a pretty good chance this old boy would be too because those things are inherited. 
So with that said, we need to be very cautious with this temple that we're given. Now you ladies do a wonderful job with this house of the Lord. What if it looked like trash? What if the windows were broken? What if, what if the floors were filthy? Would we not be upset and want to do a little something more? Surely we would. Then in the very same way, we need to watch ourselves. We need to be understanding that this is just as, this is more important than the building we meet in. The solution in verse 17, wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Now, the problem with this verse is it has a very genetic word, I mean generic word, unclean thing. Now, if we're to understand the scripture, we need to know what that is, or it could be what they are. Now, I believe the unclean thing is sin itself. It's a singular thing. But what is the manifestation of that sin? Now, I will assure you, and, and when I say this, you're going to go ding, 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 ding. I won't know, but you will. There's a sin for every individual that's very hard to deal with. Mine is different than yours, and yours is different than mine, but that's the thing. Now, sin has to be avoided. Now, it certainly has to be dealt with, but the premise, the reason for separation is to protect you. Now, if one of your youngins was going toward the river at, at full rate of speed, what would you do? I would grab them and pull them away from the, the river. You know, a lot of people don't know this. Our, our river is dredged. And the people that I have baptized in the Cumberland River down here at the boat dock, we go almost to the end of the boat dock because if you step too far, you know what it is? It's a 40-foot drop. So the barges can pass by. We wouldn't be baptizing. We'd be swimming at that point if we both could swim. You see what I'm saying? So when I'm going out there, I know about right where it drops, and I don't go no further, and I don't bring, I don't bring my candidate for baptism any further either because I'm concerned about it. I know there's a danger there. You see what I'm saying? There's a danger in, in being so overcome with the world. It's paralyzing. It's defeating. It, it, it is consuming. We need to be separate. Notice this, and when you hear messages like this, you don't hear this last part read. And I will receive you. Now, if that be true, and I think it is, the reverse has to be true as well, right? Verse 18. He commits, I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and my daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So, if you give up the world... He's going to be like a father to you. Now, in, in, in the church this morning, I have one child that is no longer adult. Adam and Sarah, you're going to have to take care of yourself. But that one, I can still correct. If she gets out of line, me and her are going to have a conversation. And if the conversation don't go my way, then something else will happen, right? She is a daughter unto me. Now, I have my grandchildren here. Now, they never do anything wrong. But if somehow they did, that's not my jurisdiction. You see what I'm saying? 
that belongs to my son and his wife. I, I, I have no dog in the hunt. Jesus has a dog in your hunt. If you're saved, you belong to him. The Bible says you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify ye him, which is your reasonable service. That's just reasonable. When, when, when you go, you know, uh, used to, you don't see it that much, and, and you ask a merchant when I was a kid about price in the store, sometimes my mom would say, well, that's reasonable. And, and what did she mean by that? She meant it was a fair price. You were getting something appropriate for the money that you were handing out. And, and, and so what we do is reasonable service isn't nothing grandiose. He paid for you. You, he owns you. We don't like to hear that, do we? So our service then is just reasonable. It, it, it's just what is to be expected. Now we're going to hit on a couple things more and we'll be done. First Timothy. Uh, 1 Timothy 2, and we're going to begin reading in uh, verse 8. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 8. I will therefore that men pray everywhere. That means outside, inside, when the assembly's together, when the assembly's not together. Anytime, anywhere, I want them to pray. I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubt. Now, there's two things a lot of time Baptists no longer do, and that is this. Why do you suppose that is? You don't want to be identified as Pentecostal, right? They took that away from us, right? Now, we have fellowship Friday night. If we get up there at Olmstead and begin this, you may get run out, right? <laughs> but it is biblical, right? We just read that that was advice that we ought to be doing. All men, lift, and, and when we pray, lift holy hands unto the Lord. Now, if you're engulfed with the world, dear friend, your hands are not holy. They, they are not where they need to be. In like manner, also, that the women adore themselves in modest apparel. Now, uh, I thought that women's dress had gone about as far as it could go. But... I just saw, and, and, and someone was going to a Valentine's dance, and they, pay, they posted a picture of the girl and her, and her boyfriend, I reckon, and it's went from worse to worse, sir. There, there wasn't enough there to wipe my face on. Is that modest? I don't, I don't think so, do you? Hey, is that something I want for my girls? No. Is it something that will interfere with you and fellowship? I think so. So the first thing that we find is a woman, and I would say a man as well, our garments need to be modest. Now, the reason why is not necessarily for you, although it is something that will, that, that will put you in the frame of mind to serve God. But listen, if a woman's about half naked, it gets men's attention, does it not? Now, gentlemen, don't, don't act like you have a deer in headlights. We all, seven of us, know exactly what we're talking about, right? You're helping, ladies, that man to stay on line. You, you're, you're not turning his head. You're not turning his eye when you are compliant with the scripture. And huh, you are responsible. In like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness 
and sobriety or seriousness, not with broiding hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but that which becometh women. Professing godliness. Here in the good old USA, what garment becometh women? Let's be honest. You go into an airport. I've been in, in the airport at Paris, France. Couldn't speak a word. Looking for the privy. You know how I found it? Because there was a man on it in breeches, and I'm like, oh, that's the men's bathroom. Right? And I went in there, and you know what? All that was in there was men. Pretty easy, ain't it? Mm -hmm. Now, my wife and my girls, they weren't with me on that trip. But how do you think they would have found it? I think the same way we've got it displayed right back there, don't you? And I want you to see, that wasn't just, I, I, was, I was literally in Europe. And it was still the exact same thing. A woman with a dress on and a man with breeches on going to the right crib. Man, that hurts, don't it? Ouch. Uh, not a pleasant topic in 2024, but I believe if we want spiritual power, and I do so badly, I want to be close to the Lord, these things are going to have to be start preached again. We don't hear it anymore. Verse 11. But let women learn in silence with all subjection that Eliminates women pastors, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to worship authority over man, but to be in silence. And then he goes on and dis discusses why this is necessary. Now, the last place, 1 Corinthians 11, in chapter 13. First Corinthians 11, beginning in, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, beginning in verse 13. First Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 13, and get the end on man. Judging yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not nature itself teach you that it is a if a man have long hair, it's a shame unto him. That's why I say the long-haired Jesus never existed. That's, that, that was a discrepancy between people's understanding of what a Nazarite priest is and a Nazarene, which is just a citizen of Nazareth. The Nazarenes did not all have long hair. When the Nazarite priest made an oath, and it was usually for seven years, during that time he would not cut his hair for seven years, but this is the reality. On the seventh year he cut it off and he'd throw it in the altar and, and burn it up. And then you know what? Then his hair went back to being short again. <laughs> and, and, and so we find then, you know what? I don't know much about today. I've seen, I've seen a lot of it lately. <laughs> among men, but that was the thing in the 80s. If you wanted to be cool, you grew your hair out. Right? Mine was kind of here. And man, I was so cool that the temperature dropped when I walked in the room. Right? That's not reality, is it? You ever wonder why the world teaches us things like that? I think it's pretty deliberate, don't you? Now, they'll, they'll, they'll be coy about it and, and, and just, oh, well, that's just what the rock groups do. No, they, they, they're very deliberate. Dear friend, they're very deliberate in what they do. We need to be cautious, don't we? 
We need to be aware. We have another generation back there on the back pew that we've got to be concerned about. What about you? You satisfied the way things are? You know, there's a couple of things in being satisfied. I'm thankful for separation. And it is a biblical truth. Don't ever, don't ever compromise on that. But are you using it for a source of pride? That's the flip side that we have to be cautious of, is it not? Mama, the bunch she ran with, they were so prideful about it. There was one similar to her that used to always come to the nursing home. And remember when we had a nursing home ministry? And one night, me and my family, all the boys were still at home right now. And uh, uh, it's a Pentecostal woman there. I think her mother was in the nursing home, but I don't remember for sure. And I preached a good message about like this one, and you know, there's crickets at the end, except for her. And when this missile was done, she ran up there to me, well, why did you get into sinless perfection? And I said, well, because I don't believe it. <laughs> and she goes, oh, I hadn't sinned in 22 years. <laughs> and I said, then why do you look so old? <laughs> did you? <laughs> <laughs> And she didn't have an answer for me. Because see, if we stop sinning, we stop aging, right? The curse of man is lifted. And she was older than me at the time. Needless to say, she didn't come back to our nursing home service. But, uh, that is, it, was I not right? And so then, just be sure when we separate, it's not so that people will look at you. Now, after 30 years working with the Mennonite Amish, I really don't look at them no more. Right. But when it first started, I was like, what are these people doing? I remember the first time I saw a Mennonite person, me and Donna had just moved to Dresden. We were taking care of those God-forsaken apartments. And, uh, and, uh, Donna was still at school at Austin P, so she drove all the way to Dresden, from Dresden all the way to Austin P for almost a whole semester. And I didn't have, we had one vehicle back then. I guess that's why we used to use car you know, because we wanted to be sure we had some wheels, right? And uh, so I had to walk to the bank and take the money from the apartments to the bank. And uh, I took a shortcut through the cemetery there's like these weird people there that uh, look like, I said, no, they, they look like pilgrims because <laughs> I was trying to explain to her what I meant. And she said, I said, they're mowing the grass over there at the cemetery. And that was my vision of the first Mennonite that I ever saw. But we don't have to be eye catchers, but we do need to be obedient. Don't you think? Because see, when we're doing it for eye catchers, we're doing it for pride. We're doing it like the Pentecostals do. 